Well, good morning, guys. It's Wednesday. Monday and Tuesday are done. They're finished. Today is Tuesday's hotter younger sister. And it's time for an alternative paper review. Where should we go first today? Should we do Tory propaganda? Should we do some conspiracy theories from the Telegraph? Should we, like, what, what, what should we do Let's first? Let's do some shameless propaganda. Propaganda it is. All right. First up to the mad rantings and dementia-riddled prose of the Daily Express today. Indeed, here they are, inspiringly letting go of the last 14 years of trauma. Just gone. Just whitewash. Indeed, it is the whitest of whitewashes. It's like the cast of friends enjoying a communal shower after they've all sat through La La Land. This wash is white. It's super white. Bleached out, clean slate. Because over here in objective reality, it was four successive conservative administrations that underfunded the prison system, gutted probations, defunded legal aid and backed up the court diaries. They took Britain from being a relatively stable democracy and society to being what? On the lower rungs, a knife crime nightmare. And in the upper echelons of the socio-economic sphere, law-breaking lawmakers like Suella Braverman, international lawbreakers like... What was it? Dominic Raab wanted to break international law, didn't he? Suella Braverman again. Rishi Sunak. So while the Conservative Party's commitment to law and order went through a uh, rocky patch, to say the least, their cheerleaders here at the Daily Express are either completely forgetting that whole period and pretending probations weren't screwed before July the 4th, that prisons weren't over capacity. Like they either don't remember that and they are as dementia riddled as most of their readership, or they are deliberately, disingenuously pretending that this is, you know, all a labor problem. <laughs> this symptom, this flare up, this is only the result of labor policy. It's got nothing to do with the Tories underfunding the prison system for 14 straight years. Absolutely nothing to do with it. Oh, careful aid. Sounds like you're talking about, you know, cause and effect and nuance. You know, you know, these people only deal with face value ones and zeros and symbolism. Okay, fine. Let, let me put this in terms that you can understand. Silly, silly, posh man, bad man. Because this is a story that some lags have been released from prison early. And this is a move designed to ease up capacity to make way for the next generation, the new class of thugs and ne'er-do-wells. You know, old, angry, white guys with placards at riots who plead guilty to violent disorder off the back of internet disinformation and then they get jail sentences. And then Isabel Oakeshott says, is this Britain's first political prisoner? To which the only sane response is no. No, it's not, is he? Now, just quickly, and then we will move on from the Daily Express. If you were forcing me to talk about this seriously for but a moment, I would say, look, the prison system is over capacity. You need to free up a few cells to put in the new, really violent, high priority offenders. And if you don't have space for them, as it is, which is the case, then yes, you're going to have to free some of the existing legacy offenders. And the reality of that initiative is that unfortunately, yes, some of those who are released ahead of time are with a high probability going to be people who have committed really unpleasant crimes, like this guy on the front page of the Express who apparently was jailed for something like ABH or GBH, but also kidnapping. Do any of us really want this guy out on the streets? No. Am I angry and fearful that almost certainly one of these guys who is released from a violent offence early will probably go on to re-offend and it will come back knocking at the door of Labour comms and Labour HQ and they're going to have to deal with that narrative. You know, am I happy about that? No. Am I jazzed about it? Absolutely not. But here is the difference between somebody like me and, you know, probably if you stuck around this long, somebody like you, is that my anger would be directed at the people whose actions or inaction caused this. Prince Andrew's a nonceberger. Next up to the Daily Mail this morning, who report that the now named Metropolitan Police officer who shot Chris Kaber in the head is rumoured to have a bounty on his own head for gangsters in the underworld. Now, this is one of those awkward situations where I have to kind of hold my hands up and confess, I may have actually got something wrong here. Like, I thought from the coverage and, you know, admittedly from the Metropolitan Police's rich tapestry of either failing to find killers of young men of colour or, you know, 
actively shooting them themselves. I thought this one was actually as simple as it appears. You know, maybe maybe I should get a job at the Daily Express and report on stuff like this there. Because the narratives that first emerged around the shooting of Chris Caber were that this was an individual who was not a suspect to the Metropolitan Police. They were not chasing him personally, specifically. They were just interested in the car that he happened to be driving that night. They told him to get out the car. He didn't. He refused. And then they shot him in the head. But that is the simple kind of pinch points of this story as it was presented. Now it turns out, after the verdict, after the case has been closed, that the police, although not the shooter himself, the actual, you know, marksman, the police did know who he was. He was already a suspect in another shooting. The car itself had been implicated in another shooting. And look, I'm not saying it's okay for the police to go, oh, well, he's he's probably guilty. Oh, he's a, he's a bit of a bad apple. So it, now it's okay if we shoot him. You know, I do still think they should like shoot him in the leg, shoot him in the tire. You know, why does everything have to go all LAPD? Like the only options you have is to shoot the guy in the head, like literally end his life. But I do think the way that this was presented in the media is actually quite concerning. And I suppose there's a few of you out there who might be thinking, well, what is your suggestion here, Ray? Do you think they should have advertised his backstory? The fact that police believed him to be gang affiliated? Wouldn't that prejudice the jury? I mean, here you are a minute ago, lamenting the rise of crime and disorder in the United Kingdom over the last decade. And now here you are only a couple of minutes later, suggesting changes to the judicial system that could quite plausibly see criminals get let off more. You know, the more that I listen to you, Wade, I don't think you really think these things through. But here is the thing, right? Journalists who printed the stories where it looked like a sort of, you know, civil rights case, like uh, another Stephen Lawrence, another instance of the Met doing something hugely problematic, savaging relationships between police and local communities. Like, no, I don't think the juries should be exposed to all of that backstory, to his CV as it were, from the criminal underworld. But I do think if I was a journalist for The Guardian or The Mirror, BBC or Sky, I think I would question whether it was worth me printing that story. Like, if I knew, if I was doing digging, like, OK, who was this guy? He, he, he was a bit dodgy, was he? OK, well, do I really want to file a story <laughs> that makes this look like something that I know that it isn't? Do you know what I mean? Anyway, let's, let's go back to the story. So the Mail is saying that the marksman now has a price on his head. You know, gangsters in South London are talking about how much they would pay an individual if they were to take this guy out of the game, as it were. Now, the temptation with this sort of story is to go either or again, to go Daily Express, to go ones and zeros. Like, these guys are bad guys. They're gangsters and they're going after this copper and he was just doing his job and he's a good guy. So isn't this terrible? Isn't this shocking? But, you know, the way that I feel like this story may or may not have been misrepresented and like I was sort of led up the garden path by the coverage before is making me question now how this sort of stuff is presented. Like, yes, they say Chris Cable was allegedly a hitman for a South London gang. And the reason they say that is because he was implicated in the shooting of a rival gang member or gang leader like the week before. Now, I don't know what these gangs are like, but if Chris Cable rose up to being a leader of a drugs gang in a part of London where there are basically no other like alternatives to being a drug dealer, to joining a gang, just to stay safe, just so you're protected against the other gangs. Let's say he rose up to being like a number two of the South London gang. And then let's say this rival gang member does something horrendous to somebody from this gang's like little sister or something. Then to even the score, he goes to the nightclub, pulls out a gun, there's a shooting. Then it becomes a story about, you know, this guy evening the score against a sexual abuser, a predator or a paedophile or something. It's about mob justice. It's about righteousness. You know, I'm not saying that's what happened. That's almost certainly not what happened. All I'm saying is that, you know, since this other new information came to light, it is making me think, you know, what else is there to this? What are the contributing factors? Yes, this is lawlessness and it's incredibly sad and lives are lost, but also how do we pin it on the Tories? No, wait. <laughs> Finally, to the Telegraph and the Eye, who both report on Offwatt, the water regulator, which is destined for the chop under a new Labour initiative. But you'll be delighted to hear that water bills are still expected to rise significantly for the next few years. So yeah, not a bit of a substance for all you symbolism fans out there all of you uh 
Oh, everybody, best country in the world, Britain. Like, what's so good about it? Well, I, I get to wave my flag. I love my flag. Right, but is the, uh, is, is the country itself good? Does it work? Uh, no. No, no, we're letting, uh, we're letting prisoners out early, gangs run the streets, there's shit in the water, and that will be £500 a cup, please. Guys, it's time for you to join my channel. Click the join button. It starts at only £3 a month. Show me some love. And in so doing, you might find yourself at a little cheeky invite to mine and Graham Hughes from Politics Social. We're going to do a sort of Christmas party, Patreon channel backer membership type meetup thing. That is in December. Join the channel.